Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm talking about photography and taking videos in public. But first of all, if you're new and you're just joining our legal community, don't forget to like this video, subscribe and hit that bell icon so that you don't miss out on new videos in case you've got questions of your own you'd like to ask of a practicing barrister. Remember, as always, this video should not be taken as a replacement for formal legal advice. Every situation rests on its own facts. And for this particular video, I'd like to stress that it is not to encourage you to argue with other people, to argue with the police or to resist police inquiries, but it is to outline what your rights are and what the situation is regarding photography and videos in public, because there's a lot of misunderstanding, there's a lot of arguments and disagreements, which hopefully I can clear up today. The starting point is to whether it's a public place or private land, and a private land could include a shop, for example. However, there might be a subtle difference if you do not know that it's private land and you're taking photographs in that scenario. Again, this is why different scenarios rest on their own facts. But let's focus for a moment on taking photos or taking video in a public place. Now, whilst there are some caveats which I will cover during the course of the video, the general position is as follows. Members of the public do not need a permit or a license or permission to take photographs or videos in a public place. The police do not have a general power to stop you from taking photographs or from filming. Again, there are some exceptions which I will come to. You have the right to take a photograph or video of any subject or any place if you are in a public place. You have the right to keep those photographs and video. You will own the copyright to those photographs and video, and they cannot be forcibly deleted or even viewed without good reason, which I'll come back to in a few moments. But the mere fact that you are taking photographs or video by itself isn't a good enough reason for you to be forcibly removed from a public place. Building on that, still talking about a public place, nobody has the right to ask you to delete photos or video that you've taken. No one has the right to view the videos or the photographs that you've taken. And nobody has the right to ask you for a copy of the videos or the photographs that you've taken. So that is the broad position of the law regarding taking photographs and videos in a public place. But as I said, and as always, there are some exceptions, there are some caveats and some scenarios that you need to be aware of if you are taking photographs and videos in a public place so that you are better equipped, better armed, to know exactly what your position is in case any of these situations arise. The first category of exemptions that I will mention are if the photographs or videos are indecent, and hopefully that should be self-explanatory. Secondly, if the photographs or the video could amount to harassment or stalking. For example, if you are following someone around deliberately, videoing or photographing their every move, this might amount to harassment and stalking. And there's a fine line here with guidelines for the media, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this video, but broadly speaking, members of the press and the media will carry an identity card, which will usually show upon request. If you wanted the media to stop taking photographs and video, you can pass this request on to the police, who in turn will pass that request onto the press or the media, and they will make that request, but it cannot be enforced. Very often with respect to specific incidents, there is what we call a vantage point, which might be set up for the media, but I will come back to specific incidents in a moment. Another broad area that's very important to consider is photographing or videoing children, because children are considered to be vulnerable subjects, and there are all kinds of potential legal vulnerabilities of filming or videoing children. For example, there would be a huge difference between a photographer taking a photograph in a brand new park of children playing and having fun to show that this park is a great asset to the community, contrasted with another photographer who is sat and filming an entire day of the same children playing in said park. And in many situations like that, again, you may be asked to stop taking photographs, for example, by a teacher, but the broad legal position is the same. But remember, if you are taking photographs of children, it is a much more complicated area, much more fact specific. And if you were arrested and you were charged with something, then just remember that the subjects in those photographs are going to be considered vulnerable subjects. And the burden on you as to why you were taking such photographs against any complaints that are made about you 
possibly are going to be more difficult. There have been incidents of people being arrested whilst taking photographs at children at public events and being asked to leave, but generally I would advise that a little bit of common sense and cooperation goes a long way so that you can avoid having to explain some very difficult situations. Just a quick reminder, if you find this video useful, please do hit subscribe. That helps the channel grow. It encourages me to make more videos to help you understand law. The next exemption I'll mention is if you're taking a photograph for the sole purpose of it being used in a commercial advert, for example, then you're going to need to get a model release form. You cannot just go and take photographs and use them in commercial work. This is because the law in relation to a model's photographic image is not codified in a single piece of legislation. For example, there are possible implications with the Copyright Designs and Patent Act of 1988, the Data Protection Act of 2018 and the retained GDPR provisions, and possibly a breach of confidence because whilst there is no statutory privacy law in the United Kingdom, there is a growing body of case law which can prevent the unauthorized publication of an individual's image. Contract law is also engaged because a model would ordinarily be under some sort of a contract for release of their photograph and use of their photograph image in advertisements, and it would govern what happens to that photograph, who it's distributed to, and so on. So again, if you're planning to use photographs for commercial purposes, please take formal advice. Don't rely on snippets here and there. This is just a brief overview so you have an idea of what laws might be engaged if you take photographs or videos for such purposes. Some common questions or statements perhaps that you might come across whilst out taking photographs in a public place are as follows. Number one, you don't have the right to take my photograph. Well, by law, you can take the photograph of any subject in a public place and you don't need their permission to do so. Similarly, provided the warnings that I've given you about taking photographs of your children, you might have someone say, you don't have the right to take a photograph of my child. Again, the law doesn't address this specifically. You can take that photograph of any subject in a public place. With both of those questions, if it is clear that it is a private premises, you will need to seek permission from the owner. And if the owner asks you to stop taking photographs, then you must do so. Another question or statement might be, you are invading my privacy. As I've said before, there is no statutory privacy law in the United Kingdom. A lot of it will come down to common sense. Is the photograph indecent? Is it really invading the person's privacy? Do they have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that location at that time doing whatever it is that they are doing? Every case is fact specific, so they will all turn on their own facts. But broadly speaking, there is no automatic breach of privacy just because you are taking a photograph or a video. Another question or statement might be, I don't like the photograph that you've just taken. I want you to delete it. Now, as I said before, neither your photograph subject nor anyone else has the right to force you to delete the photograph or video. And this also goes for security guards and police, which I'm going to come back to. Another question or statement might be that the child subject is under 16 years old and therefore you cannot publish the photograph. However, there is no specific age in law that prevents publication of a photograph. But please do bear in mind the things I've said about whether a photograph is indecent, whether it might amount to stalking, harassment, or any other kind of breach of privacy, because every situation turns on its own facts. There is not one simple blanket rule across the board. You must remember that each case will be looked at independently. Moving on to another subject of photography and section 43 of the Terrorism Act 2000. I've seen lots of videos lately of people taking photographs and videos in public, but say of a police station or police officer, and being searched under section 43 of the Terrorism Act. As usual, there is a short version and a long version. And as an advocate, I always start with the simplified conclusion. So the broad position under section 43 is as follows. A constable may stop and search a person whom he reasonably suspects to be a terrorist to discover whether he has in his possession anything which may constitute evidence that he is a terrorist. A constable may also seize and retain anything which he discovers in the course of a search of a person under subsection one or two above, in which he reasonably suspects may constitute evidence that the person is a terrorist. So as with many police powers, this one is also derived from reasonable suspicion. 
and there's a code of practice for implementing section 43 searches which I will link in the description. Some important wording that I take from this code of practice is as follows. That there must be an objective basis for the suspicion, objective being what a reasonable person would think, that the person is a terrorist or that the vehicle is being used for the purposes of terrorism based on relevant facts, information and or intelligence. And that reasonable suspicion must rely on intelligence or information about or behavior by the person or vehicle concerned. And it goes on to say that reasonable suspicion may arise without specific information or intelligence, but on the basis of the behavior of a person. For example, reasonable suspicion that a person is a terrorist may arise from the person's behavior at or near a location which has been identified as a potential target for terrorists. So in other words, on the one hand, there could be relevant facts, information and or intelligence that form a reasonable suspicion for a particular area. That might be that a particular location is of specific interest or at heightened alert, or in the example given that a person's behavior at or near such a location has given rise to suspicion. So if we take two different scenarios, one potentially by a police station and another one which is miles away from anything, the behavior in each of those locations could be viewed quite differently. But that doesn't exclude the possibility that a person's behavior in a location miles away from anything could amount to reasonable suspicion that they're acting in a course of terrorism. But taking the scenario next to a police station, I suspect that threshold is going to be very much lower but by their own code of practice, it should normally be based on a range of factors, not just the behavior of the person itself. The point of all this, of course, is that if a person is taking photographs or videos at or near a police station and their behavior and possibly other relevant factors all taken together, give the police the power of a search under section 43, then they will have the authority to view and potentially detain the images that have been taken. But that is not to say, of course, that such a search should be justified in each and every case. Of course, they should be justified. Now, I said I would come back to specific incidents and one such example would be as follows. Let's say there's been a horrific road traffic collision and the police are in attendance and they suspect that a particular person is the cause of this collision. If you turn up and start taking photographs, you might well be asked to stop and to leave because your photographs may prevent the police in their real investigations and inquiries as to how this collision or how this incident occurred and in doing so interfere with the course of justice. So in that scenario, if you were taking photographs, again, I would recommend asking the police officers for a specific vantage point where you are permitted to take such photographs and confirm that you are not going to be in breach of any of those procedural requirements. And finally, some broad guidelines of do's and don'ts that I would recommend as follows. Firstly, I would suggest being polite and respectful at all times. If at all possible, ask permission before taking photographs. This can very often overcome problems before they occur. Of course, act sensibly, responsibly, be prepared to answer questions and be interactive and be polite when answering these questions. That can avoid arguments before they start. And a few blanket don'ts when taking photographs or videos that are likely to get you into trouble. Of course, don't frighten, intimidate, stalk, and harass people in order to get your photographs. Try to avoid taking photographs where a reasonable person would expect privacy, even if you are in a public place. If it seems that it's a quiet, cozy conversation, perhaps try to avoid photographs and videos in those scenarios because there may well be a reasonable expectation of privacy, even in a specific location within a public place. If somebody does question you about taking photographs or videos in public, don't get angry about it. Just have a polite conversation. Explain that there are no specific laws, that what you are doing is lawful, providing that it is. And if at all possible, seek permission or consider whether your photograph is really worth the argument, depending on the circumstances. And finally, I would urge you to look for public liability insurance, which is available for photographers and videographers, which is certainly worth looking into and something you might discuss with your standard home insurance. Look to whether there's any extra legal protection and what that might cover, which you can bundle in with your home insurance, because very often that will cover some public liability issues as well. So I hope this video has been a useful overview of taking photographs and videos in public. Don't forget to like the video if you found some use. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.